somebody is always the first one to right. test positive. And then our next step is to tell that person that they need to share all of this information that we just gave them with as many family members as possible. Because it's that cascade of events, actually we call it cascade okay. testing then, is where our real potential is to keep people from getting cancer. This is the James Cancer Free World Podcast. I'm Steve Wartenberg, and my guest is Leah Center. Leah is a James licensed genetic counselor who specializes in hereditary gynecological cancers and something that's called cascade testing in families with hereditary cancer syndromes. Genetic testing and counseling saves lives, and the James has one of the largest and best programs anywhere. Welcome to the podcast, Leah. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. This is a really interesting and important topic, so I'm ready to get going. And I thought we could start with something kind of basic, but not quite as simple as it sounds. And that's kind of what are genetic mutations and how do they cause cancer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, There are thousands and thousands of genes inside every single cell of your body, and we know that a certain class of them actually are working all of the time to help protect us against cancer. So that's their job. And you can imagine if you had some of those genes or one of those genes not working properly, that means the protection isn't happening at the level that you would want it to. Are you talking about the immune system? Not necessarily. Ah, No, no, not the immune system. Um, So these genes generally are involved in telling your cells when it's time to stop growing. Oh, Um, And we all acquire mutations over the course of our lifetime, just the natural process of aging, really. But in cancer genetics, we're focused on those rare instances where a person can be born with a mutation. It's kind of like a glitch in one of these cancer protector genes that's increasing that person's chance of developing cancer over their lifetime. Now, if a person is born with a mutation, is that always or sometimes from an inherited genetic mutation? Generally, yes. Um, So these kinds of mutations that are inherited are usually passed through families from parents to children. And those mutations don't guarantee that a person is absolutely going to get cancer in their lifetime. But compared to the average person, it makes the chance much greater. Okay, so there's inherited genetic mutations, but there's also ones that are acquired through smoking, too much exposure to the sun, right? Yes. And those you can't, those are not inherited, so there are no way to know if a person has them, that cancer until they have that cancer. That's right. And those, the other distinction is that those kinds of mutations that we acquire over our lifetime aren't passed on right. um, oh, yeah. to our children. That's important. So when you say passed on, how does that work? If just to make it easier, um, a, a husband and wife, mm-hmm. the mo- mother, has a, an inherited genetic mutation. What happens when she has children? Yeah. So each of these mutations, for the most part in cancer genetics, there are some exceptions, but most of them are what we call dominant, meaning that you can have one mutation in one gene, and that gives you the increased risk. And so in your example, any child of that pair would have a 50-50 chance of also having that same genetic mutation and as a result those same increased cancer risks. Each child would have a 50-50 risk and if the it was it the same if it's the father. That's correct. Yep, okay. you can inherit, inherit these from either parent. And then each child if the first child does not have the inherited genetic mutation are their children safe? If you don't have it, you can't have passed it on. Um, So it does stop when there's something truly inherited in the family. Some people take the 50-50 risk of inheriting one of these mutations to assume that that means if they have two children, one will have it and one won't, you know, the one and two. But it really is an independent 50% chance for every single child. So... That's when we get into the importance of genetic testing and family history. So let's talk about that family history. Um, Because every time you go to the doctor, they always ask for your family Mm -hmm. history. And and it's actually very, very important to know and give your family history to your primary care physician. 
It is. And family histories are dynamic. They change over time. So if you feel like you're answering the same questions every time you go to the doctor, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, because at some point, the answers to those questions are going to change. Um, not sure if your parent has an incident the next time you see the doctor, you might want to put that in there. That's right. That's right. And, and you know, when we think about family history and cancer genetics, sometimes we're thinking about a broader spectrum of relatives, though. You know, sometimes people may ask about your siblings and parents, and those are very important, obviously. But it matters if your grandparents or your aunts or uncles, even your cousins, um, have been diagnosed with cancer. And all of that information really can inform how likely it is that your family has a hereditary predisposition to cancer. So give us sort of an example of a patient or two you've seen that had the type of family history that would make their primary care physician say, hey, you need to go see Leah and get a genetic counsel screening and counseling. Yeah. Um, I think the primary care community relies a lot on the published criteria that tell them, you know, if you see a patient and they see this in their family history, they should be referred. But some of the common reasons that might raise a red flag are having a person in your family who was diagnosed with a cancer at a, at a younger than expected age. Um, that can raise a red flag from a hereditary standpoint or you're seeing a pattern of cancers in the family that we know can be linked together in a hereditary way. So sometimes we know breast and ovarian cancers um, are inherited in a similar fashion. And so whenever your provider notices that in your family history, or if you're a patient and you notice yeah. that in your own family history, you should probably ask um, about seeing someone in cancer genetics. But the tricky part of all of this is, you know, we have all of these red flags to pay attention for, but sometimes we don't see the red flags and a person ends up with a hereditary predisposition. So if you have anyone in your family, just a single person with ovarian cancer or a single person in your family with pancreatic cancer, we know that those are sometimes associated with hereditary syndromes more commonly than some other cancer types. And that's all it would take. So we're not seeing, you know, 30 people in the same family with the same kind of cancer. It doesn't need to be that extreme. But knowing your family history definitely makes a difference. But it also can be fairly extreme, maybe not 30 people, but it could be a mother, daughter, grandmother could all have had breast cancer at an earlier than expected age, and that's really a red flag, right? Yes, or yeah. Or colorectal cancer the same way. That's right. So actually, that, that, at least to me, brings up a question is, what are some of the most common uh, inherited genetic mutations, and what do they cause? Mm -hmm. um, one of the most common hereditary cancer syndromes is associated with mutations that you can inherit in one of two genes, BRCA1 or BRCA2. Um, sometimes people pronounce those BRCA. Right. Um, but I, I've learned that geneticists don't like that. <laughs> that's true. You like to say the whole... We do, you, what, yeah. Tell, what does it stand for? Yeah. <laughs> BR stands for breast and CA is cancer. Um, so it's an inherited breast cancer genetic mutation. It is. And, two, and there's two types. Right. So there are two separate genes and a single mutation in either of those genes does in fact increase the risk for breast cancer in females and potentially males. Um, but what we've grown to learn over the years are those same two genes are also the most common cause of hereditary ovarian cancer, hereditary pancreatic cancer, and hereditary prostate cancer. Wow. And so when we think about it now, if we had known all of this many, many years ago, those genes may have a different name um, because they're not just associated with breast cancer risk. But oh, I hadn't thought of that. Initially, they detected it in breast cancer patients, but if they had detected it in prostate cancer, it could have a whole different name. And that name probably prevented some people from being as aware of it as they should have been. Right. And, you know, I feel like if anybody's talking about these genes, it's a good thing. Um, yeah. But we really do have to keep reminding people these are not exclusively breast cancer genes. They are very important for families and patients with lots of different kinds of cancer. So if, and this might get a little complicated, but if a woman and has one of the two BRCA genes, mm -hmm. how much does that increase her risk of breast cancer or other types of cancer? 
It does increase it significantly. So most females have about a 12% chance or so over the course of their lifetime to develop breast cancer, give or take. With one of these mutations, depending on the study that you read, that risk can be anywhere from 50 to 80%. Wow, more than half. Yeah, yeah. So obviously when we identify that in a person, if they've not had cancer, we need to make their screening plan match that higher level of risk right. and you know, not just subscribe to the average risk recommendations. And now, obviously, you would want to do more mammograms or other kind of breast imaging more frequently, but because it causes other types of cancer, how do you screen for that as well? Right. So this is partly where the family history is so important. Uh -huh. um, but when a person has a BRCA mutation, we absolutely start breast imaging younger and okay. do it more intensely with breast MRI in addition to mammogram. Yeah. Um, but ovarian cancer is very difficult to yeah. screen for. And in that situation, we actually do recommend removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes. The timing is different for every person who tests positive. Um, but with pancreatic cancer screening, it's not something that's available just everywhere, but if you have a BRCA mutation and a family history of pancreatic cancer, we do actually recommend meeting with a specialist for consideration of pancreatic surveillance. We are very lucky to have someone who offers that here um, at the James, and so we refer a lot of our patients for that discussion. And men can get the BRCA as well, so that's right. and pass it on. Mm -hmm. So that's important to know. So that's I, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that the most common genetic mutation you see, or just one of it's them? It's one of the what? most common, I think. So yeah. what, what would be another another one? Lynch syndrome is another one that's probably similarly as prevalent in people. And Lynch syndrome is caused by mutations in a different set of genes, so not the BRCA genes, but there are a handful of other genes that can cause Lynch syndrome. And when you have inherited a mutation in one of those genes, it increases risk primarily for colon cancer and endometrial or uterine cancer. But then there are other cancers that we can see at an increased frequency too. Now I've learned from, from you and others that the amazing thing about detecting someone with Lynch syndrome is you can find precancerous polyps and prevent the person from ever getting cancer. So how do you make that happen when you figure out a family has Lynch syndrome and begin your testing. That, that's exactly right. It's one of the very few screening tools that we have at our disposal that can keep a cancer from happening rather than detect it um, at an early stage, which is also important. But, you know, a lot of people don't love us telling them yeah. that they need to have colonoscopy, starting at a younger age and doing it more frequently. But it's so important when a family has Lynch syndrome and really is life-changing for the family if they're able to get their colonoscopy. Well, I, I would add life-saving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. You're right. And that means that someone now, you start, you're supposed to start at 45, but if you have Lynch syndrome, you would start your testing at Potentially as early as age 25, or okay. if you happen to have a family history where people were getting cancer even younger than that, we would start younger based on your family history. Um, some forms of Lynch syndrome don't usually present as young, and so in those families, we'll adjust the age to 30. But the idea is we're using the genetic test results to make a personalized plan for the family. Uh, per, uh, making a personalized plan through genetic testing is, is key. Mm -hmm. so, is there another uh, inherited genetic mutation or two do you want to just briefly mention? We don't have to get into as much detail because I know that there's a lot. There <laughs> are a lot. You know, we used to just test for one or two of these things at a time. You know, we would see a family and just test them for the BRCA mutations. But we know that those genes are not the only ones that are playing a role in our cancer risk. And so over the last 10 years or so, the discoveries have really come rapidly. And it's pretty typical when we see a patient um, in cancer genetics now that we're ordering a test that includes 30 genes, sometimes 70 or 80 genes, where having a mutation in any of them is going to increase your risk. Um, 
you know, there are genes that work alongside the BRCA genes, for example, um, and all of those genes increase risk for a similar constellation of um, cancers too. And so the whole idea is, you know, getting that information and putting the plan in place. Um, but we're learning more and more about these newer cancer genes. And so as a result, our understanding of what it means to have them has changed over time too. So it sounds like it's impossible for any one or even any primary care physician to know every single genetic mutation, but talk to your family doctor, get a thorough family history. And if there's any red flags, come to see you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. Mm hmm Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we'll, we'll dive into the actual process of a genetic screening test, what it, what it discovers, and then how Leah uses that information to help people. You didn't choose cancer, but you can choose where to treat it. And when you choose the James at Ohio State, you're picking a team of experts who understand there is no routine cancer. You're opting for care from a highly specialized team dedicated to treating one type of cancer, yours. A team that studies the unique makeup of your disease to develop a personalized treatment plan. You're choosing our region's only comprehensive cancer center designated by the National Cancer Institute. Where more than 1,700 scientists are working on new treatments and new hope for every form of cancer. At the James, you're making the choice to have the most advanced treatments, many of which were developed right here. And you're choosing access to the James world-class clinical trials, dedicated support services, and an unmatched survivorship program to support your life after cancer treatment. You didn't choose cancer, but the choice of where to treat it is clear. We're back with Leah and we're gonna talk about the actual genetic test and how's it done? I don't even know, do they take blood, saliva, do they, is it magic? How do you, <laughs> how do, you do it? Always a little bit of magic. <laughs> no, we, um, we have lots of options now, but generally speaking, once we have determined what a person's options are for genetic testing based on their family history, their personal kind of goals for what they want to get out of the genetic testing, most of the testing for the inherited things is done using a blood sample or a saliva test even. So a lot of our appointments, you know, sometimes we're sitting together in the same room, but we often do them via video or telehealth. And in that situation, we can handle things remotely. So we can ask the genetic testing lab to send materials to a patient at home where they can spit into a tube and send it back. Oh, this concept of doing it remotely makes it so much easier for patients, particularly since the, the James is so good and you get patients from so far away, they don't have to drive 200 miles here after they, you know, three times. They just can meet with you remotely or over, you know, video, and oh, that makes it so much easier. Yeah, it really has increased access. Yeah. Um, and even just for people who don't live far away, but they have transportation issues or, you know, their job isn't very flexible right. and they can carve out a shorter amount of time because they don't have to drive here. It's really allowed patients to access us easier. So I do know that um, some of your research centers on once you've determined that a person that you've done this genetic screening on has, we'll just say Lynch or mm -hmm. BRCA, you're, you've become an expert in how do you then communicate with not just that person, but help that person communicate with their family to, I'm not exactly sure, spread the news and, mm -hmm. and help them to figure out if they need to be tested. Yeah, it's a really interesting situation. So, you know, we spend a lot of our time identifying these mutations in a family, and somebody's always the first one to right. test positive. And then our next step is to tell that person that they need to share all of this information that we just gave them with as many family members as possible, because it's that cascade of events. Actually, we call it cascade okay. testing then, is where our real potential is to keep people from getting cancer because we need to identify that they have a high risk and then put that screening and risk reduction plan in place. And that step of telling all of your family members this new information is not easy no. for most people. And it's impacted by 
so many different things, you know, your family dynamics. And if you happen to have cancer, you've also got a million other things on your plate. And um, so some of our work has been in finding ways to make that process easier for people. So, um, you know, we have video messages that patients can forward along, you know, with a text message that give a lot of good information in two minutes time to at least get the conversation started. Um, and, you know, a lot of the genetic counselors will write letters to family members that the patient can literally just copy or email on. Um, but that piece of telling family members is really at the crux of cancer genetics. You know, that's why we do what we do. So if, um, again, we'll just use a, a woman who has a, the BRCA, mm-hmm. what, how far out does she have to cascade her uh, parents and children I'm guessing pretty certainly, because that's a yeah. direct line, but who else? You know, we really recommend that you go as far as you can go. Um, it If you're doing it in an exact stepwise fashion, which doesn't always happen, <laughs> <laughs> um, but of course you would start with your closest relatives and then sort of branch out as you determine who in the family also has the mutation right. and who doesn't, because then of course anybody, any of their offspring don't need to be informed. But I find that most families don't fit a nice, you know, symmetric picture. And so if you are only in touch with one of your 20 cousins, tell that person and then hope that they They share with the people that they are linked to. um, Because the information can impact generations, you know, in very distant branches of the family. And now people are spread out all over the country and some could even live abroad. So say we're here in Columbus, you have a relative, well, I have a relative in England. Mm -hmm. So where would my sister go if there was some indication she should get a test? And how would that, would you be connected to that test? Yeah. So what we would do is give you the pieces of information that are most critical to share with your relative in England. Um, We also would identify places in England that would offer the equivalent test to what we would do here. Um, You know, there are some areas of the world where that's really hard, you know, where they don't have cancer genetics readily available. Um, But we're lucky enough to have a very broad network of research colleagues and even clinical colleagues um, that we can reach out to to try to get patients connected. So you'll find somewhere for yeah. someone to go. <laughs> and what I think I've learned is it, here in Ohio, there are places down in Appalachia that may not have genetic testing facilities, but you can figure out a way to get those people here or That's right. connect with their physician to get their blood or saliva here. Yes. And so. now that we rely on telehealth so much, yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, I'll be seeing family members via video, you know, they live two hours away, they're not close to a medical facility, but we can handle things through the mail. And then when it comes time to doing their screening, they don't mind, you know, coming here for their once a year appointment or something, but we can make it those critical appointments they need to travel for and the rest we can handle at home. Wow. So in an extended family with with like three generations in a row have like six, seven, or eight kids. That 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 cascade is could be a hundred or more people. It can. Yeah. Wow. And it's fun to get to meet all the different family yeah. members if we're lucky enough to do that. But yeah. Maybe they could just all have a big reunion and you can test everyone on the same day. <laughs> I like, have been to a couple uh, reunions yeah. before. Yeah. And do you get to you get to eat some good food as well? I do, and yeah. Get, uh, <laughs> Bonus. One of the perks of the job. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about you know, having the right facilities to do this. And we're lucky here in Columbus, we have the James and you are part of one of the the biggest, best genetic counseling programs in anywhere. So what does it include? Like how big of a program and what are some of the specialties and and options and things that people can can get here? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're really lucky that we have about 12 genetic counselors on faculty supporting just the cancer program. And over the years, genetic counselors have kind of spread out within the James. And so 
almost every specialty that you might be seen in, you'll have a genetic counselor available to you who primarily specializes in GI cancers or primarily specializes in gynecologic cancers. And so you get a really deep knowledge um, in doing that. Um, but the downstream step of all of this, which is so important, is that all of the screening that we're recommending we have access to here. here yes. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it would be pretty unsatisfying to identify a family with a hereditary predisposition, know that they needed specific cancer screenings, and then not be able to offer it to them. But we don't have that problem. So it's great. But someone who lives in rural Alaska, who's a family member of someone you diagnosed here, may have that problem. They might, although or, this is where we rely on our network to... to um, you know, genetic counselors are pretty connected. It's not a huge profession. And so I might call my colleague in Alaska and say, where can this person get a breast MRI? You so know? you'll never leave someone hanging. You'll always find them <laughs> somewhere to go. Yeah, we're pretty <laughs> diligent about that. So that's the way you say that and, and you're kind of your passion toward it, that, that must be kind of the reward. What is that like when you've helped identify a family with BRCA or Lynch and you've screened lots of relatives and you 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 actually are saving lives yeah. what is that like it's why I do this work I think it's why most of my colleagues would say that they do this work you know the potential to intervene in a family's cancer history is really unique and I don't take for granted the possibility of meeting lots of members of the same family. You sort of get to know a lot of them from a bunch of different angles, but sometimes people will think that telling a person that they tested positive is really difficult. You know, mm -hmm. how do you do that all the time? Yeah. But I sort of think of it as a gift to the family. You know, this is information they didn't have before, and we can do something about it that may, you know, really impact them and their family members. It is very great to be able to tell a person in a hereditary family that they didn't inherit yeah. <laughs> what we know is there. I mean, there's no getting around that. That's really great. Um, but it's it's meaningful work, and we learn a lot from the families. I, I would think you get mixed reactions from people that you tell that they're positive. Some are relieved, some are a little stressed out, and mm -hmm. some are both. But like you said, once they, that knowledge is powerful and can help them to either prevent cancer in some cases or catch it in the very, very earliest stages. Breast cancer in the early stages is more than 95% curable. So yeah. that that's, you know, you can use that information to for good. Right. And these days, sometimes a cancer patient's genetic test results also impact their treatment course and, you know, oh, what medicines what, they may take. And... You know, that's another big part of this, too. So in addition to having a legacy for your family, really, it's also something that may be beneficial for the patient right now. Wow, that's a whole nother topic for a podcast. Yeah. How identifying the specific mutation leads to the precision cancer medicine that's right. that gets better results in cancer. So that's a whole nother way that geneticists are part of the uh, cancer process and treatment. That's so, right. Wow. So you do a lot. Yeah, it's exciting, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing all that. And I and this is just great, useful information that people should know. And so the takeaway is to know your family history, talk to your family physician about it, and if there's any issues, you know where to go. That's right. <laughs> okay, That's right. well, thanks for joining us and filling us in. Thanks for having me. This podcast is brought to you by the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital, and Richard J. Solov Research Institute. For more information, check out our website, cancer.osu.edu.